Good evening and welcome to The Road Less Travelled in, Char in Trading. My name's Charlie Burton and I'm your host for this evening in conjunction with Tick Mill. Uh, just 60 seconds on who I am. I've been trading since 1997, so I'm in my 25th year of trading. I uh, started in 97 on the side of my career and then by the end of 2001, so about November 2001, uh, I, I left my career and um, to just trade. Now, I've been been trading all of that time since then. I'm an FCA authorized money manager. Um, if I am going to be teaching anybody, I always think that I should be able to put my neck on the line and be an authorized money manager. It doesn't get much better than that. I'm five times undefeated trading head-to-head uh, -head live trade-off champion at the London Forex show. And uh, so that was five years running. I won that for the five years that they run that. And But mo most of you, if you have seen me before, you may uh, uh, recall seeing me on the BBC TV programme, Millions, Traders Millions by the Minute, where I was washing my Porsche on the car, on the drive. And many of you people always remember that moment in that TV programme. Is there anything else to mention? Um, no, I think we're pretty much there. Um, I also run my own Although I have my own funds, I also have a trading education company as well called charliebertontrading.com. You can always check me out on social media. Right, let's get into the presentation. So this road less travelled in trading is all about the road less travelled. It's what the majority of traders don't do. So that's what we're going to be discussing tonight what the majority of traders don't do so and because I want to be doing the opposite of what they do do so let's have a look through this but before I can go any further we do need to go through the risk disclaimer the disclaimer material provided is for information purposes tonight only and should not be considered as investment advice. The views, information or opinions expressed in the text uh, belong solely to the author and not to the author's employer, organisation, committee or other group or individual or company. High risk warning, CFDs are complex instruments and come with a high risk of losing money uh, rapidly due to leverage. 75% and 74% of retail investor accounts lose money when trading CFDs with Tickmail UK Limited and Tickmail Europe Limited, respectively. You should consider whether you understand how CFDs work and whether you can afford to take the high risk of losing your money. Okay, that's the typical uh, regulated disclaimer that we have to um, go through there. Okay, so what we're going to start off with is the overview. The overview. What is it that so many traders do and should we be doing the opposite of what they do now most of us know these sorts of stats around 80 percent of retail traders fail you've just seen on the risk disclaimer slide there 75 percent um a figure of 75 percent there so we'll, we'll go with a rough 80 percent of retail traders that fail so what we need to explore tonight first of all so what we're going to be doing is explore the things that they do and see if we can do the opposite. And then I will show you an entry technique that I typically use, and I'll give you some examples of that. Now, the one thing I'm not going to do is I'm not going to insult your intelligence by showing you some nice cherry-picked examples that all went and made me money or, you know, I got in and got out and you know at, at given levels i'm at, i've actually cherry picked two examples that didn't work but they're still quite nice examples and i'll explain those to you so um there's the one thing that i hate doing is taking screenshots of uh of uh charts and then saying oh i got in here and i got out there oh that's not for me so i'm going to show you the ones i got in and the ones that, and why they didn't work out. So um, we'll go through that here this evening. So we've got a bit to go through here. So what we need to do is look at the things that retail traders do and can we do the opposite? So the typical traits of retail traders to start off with, they want to avoid being wrong at all costs. And this is why we have to have these risk disclaimers in the first place, because 
so many retail traders do things like don't use stop stop oh yes dave yes sorry just seen your comment there yeah better to ask for uh, forgiveness than permission yes i remember that one now no thanks for the reminder um so they want to avoid being wrong at all at all costs so the reason that we have to have these disclaimers is because what people don't use stop losses because if you don't use stop losses then you're not being wrong are you <laughs> and the market may always come back for you so it's amazing the power of the psyche when it comes to things like that so that's a typical thing that they will do they will either not use a stop at all hence why the risk disclaimers because that's what so many traders do and then that's how they end up blowing up accounts or they'll use ultra wide stops or move their stops as price gets towards them it's amazing the thing the typical things that traders do now when I say that these are the typical things that traders do, not the well-educated traders here at Tickmill, they have a great trading program and educational webinars, putting on regular webinars. And so because they have a vested interest, they want their customers uh, to trade responsibly. They don't want people um, doing that sort of thing. So um, that's what we're going to be focusing on here is doing the right things. And I'm sure most of you are. So I'm probably preaching. I'm sure I'm preaching to the converted. But what we're interested in is those masses out there. That's what I'm interested in. I'm not interested in the retail traders who actually do do it right, who use stops and have technical strategies or, what, or macro strategies. That's fine. I'm interested in what, what are all those others doing out there who are all blowing up accounts all around the world all the time? Because if I can tap into what they're up to and their psyche, then that can help me. Okay, so another typical um, trait of traders is that they bank profits too soon. They trade on gut instinct. They don't have a trade plan, a lot of them. I don't know, we tend to, but um, but most of them don't have a trading plan. And they'll do things, therefore, like they'll short rising markets and they'll buy falling markets. Now, before anyone has a go at me for saying that, um, I'm not talking about if you've got a specific strategy, which actually may well get you short on a rising market or get you into and um, buy a falling market. That's different. You've got a, a risk risk management. You've got a, a trading strategy. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about people trading on on gut feel when it comes to the markets. And um, it's amazing what the masses tend to do. They see a market going up and they think, oh, it surely can't rise any further. I better short it. And they go on gut instinct. Or it might be that their stochastic indicator has got overbought and they think, well, that's it. It's overbought. I better short this market. So all those sorts of typical things they do. So let's have a look at stops first of all. Why are traders so afraid of losing trades? Coming back to that, of trying to avoid losing trades at all, at all costs. Well, it really comes down to survival instinct. It, we are hardwired to survive. So going back a millennia, um, you know, we need to make sure that we're not, when we're out on the plains or wherever we may have been in our tribes, that um, we're not going to get attacked. And if we get attacked by, for example, a wild animal, we need to make sure that we can run away from there. So it's just typical survival instinct. It's hardwired into our DNA. And the problem is that that flight or fight response that we get, and if anyone's not read it, there's a great book on fight or flight responses and on our biological responses to trading, and it's called The Hour Between Dog and Wolf. I'll say it again. It's called The Hour Between Dog and Wolf. It's a great read. It's quite hard going at some points because the author is a uh, PhD biologist, <laughs> but um, it's a fascinating read. It is a trading book. So The Hour Between Dog and Wolf is that book. So don't underestimate our survival instinct there. And the other thing is, it's how we're taught in the real world. We we go through our childhood into all the way through our schooling, into university, and then into the working world, being taught that being being right, being correct is the right thing. 
and we don't want to be wrong. We want to get as high marks as possible in our exams and then again, likewise, into our careers. And that is correct for the real world. But we have to toss it out of the window and not worry about that stuff when it comes to trading. We have to turn it upside down and say, well, actually, the survival instinct, that fight or flight response to run away from trouble actually doesn't tend to serve us well in the markets. And trying to be right as much as possible, which does serve us well in the real world, doesn't serve us well in the markets. If we try and be right as much as possible, then all that ends up doing is trading becomes stressful because we're so focused on trying to have as many winners as possible and not focused on the whole process of trading and looking at overall profitability. So traders will do what they can to be right as much as possible. And yet we know that the majority lose money. In fact, another UK broker did a study just a few years ago um, of their own clients that showed that their average clients across all clients had a win rate of 64%. And yet 75% of their clients lose. <laughs> so how is that? How can they have a 64% success rate? And yet 75% of them lose. It's because uh, they run their stops and bank their profits in relative terms too early. So if you've got super wide stops, but then relative to that, or if you use stops at all, um, so you're taking big risks if a trade goes wrong. But when you have your profitable trades, you tend to bank them. Um, then you've got an inverted risk to reward, so to speak. And that's why... Um, um, that broker's uh, clients actually had a reasonable win rate and yet they still lost money because their risk reward was inverted. So traders will widen their stops or don't use them through the fear of being wrong. And those two, those two primal um, uh, emotions that we have, fear and greed, as most of you know, are huge when it comes to trading the markets. OK, so let's have a look at banking profits. Let's see what else they do. Well, it's that same fear of being wrong ensures that traders will jump out of profit trades, profitable trades too early. It's very difficult seeing open profits disappear if a trade reverses. So what's the best thing that a trader can do? Bank it. And I've heard traders use the phrase, I'm sure some of you have heard this before, you can't go broke banking a profit. Well, you can. <laughs> if you're risking 100 to make one, well, um, at some point, you're going to lose 100. And um, you will go broke if your risk reward is too inverted in that example. So it, I understand and we know that it's very difficult to see an open profit um, reverse. So that fear of being wrong is the same driver of banking the profits. You don't, none of us want to see a a profitable trade roll over against us and then become a loss. None of us want to see that. But unfortunately, we've got to run towards that type of that type of thing. Embrace it rather than try and push away from it. OK, so. It may be difficult, but that's what the masses are doing. They're banking their profits too too early through fear. They're, some of them will also be banking their profits uh, through greed as well. We'll come back to that. So you imagine you've just, you're a trader, you've just had a trade, it's been in profit, and then it's rolled all the way over. What are you going to think? Well, I won't let that happen again, type of mindset. Because of course, as human beings, we naturally want to fix things. We naturally want to fix something that we deem to be wrong. So you imagine you've just had a profitable trade that was running quite nicely. It's rolled over, stopped you out uh, for a loss, let's say. And you think, right, I, I need to fix something. This didn't work out. This isn't the way it's supposed to be. And uh, so <laughs> next time, the next time you're in, in profit, what do you do? You start banking your profits. And it, that's a typical sort of trait and the sort of things that go on. Like I've said, it can be a greed-led decision as well. So again, a greed-based individual. So we have greed-based traders and fear-based traders. 
a greed-based individual who may have the ego um, is going to say, well, um, well, if I bank it, then at least I can prove, again, prove that I was right on that trade. So it can be an ego-leg decision as well to bank profits early. So as I've already said, as humans, it's very difficult holding on to profitable trades. Most of you, I'm sure, whenever you've been in any uh, profitable trades, will feel that. It's quite difficult. We naturally want to get in and get out. Um, it's, a, it's that natural uh, instant gratification that we would prefer to have. Unfortunately, with trading and likewise with investing, um, and you just listen to anything that Warren Buffett says, uh, delayed gratification is where the true wealth comes. Okay, so we've already ascertained now that holding a position can be hard. Okay, so what else do they do? Well, they trade on gut feel as well. So they can look at any trending market and we'll, we'll see professionals in the main trading in that direction. Just look at the commitment of traders reports and you'll see the pros um, are normally trading in the same direction of um, the market they're trading. You can see that in the commitment of traders reports. However, we do have access to uh, data on websites which will show us retail traders positioning, <laughs> which is quite useful. And so often when a market is running up, retail traders will be doing the opposite. Coming back to what I said earlier on, they trade on gut feel, on emotions. And so they see a market going up and they, they don't, they can't bring themselves to trading on that, in that direction. Um, because through fear that it might reverse. So they think, oh, it can't possibly go any higher. And um, and then they start doing that. Now, don't get me wrong here. I'm not going going against people who are, uh, who know what they're doing, who, you know, will fade a spike in a market or a run up because they've got certain levels they're looking at. That's different. I'm talking about the masses who are trading on gut feel and just on things like overbought and oversold indicators and doing it the wrong way. So two reasons. They believe that they can catch a turn because it poss can't possibly go higher. And their oscillator, as I've said earlier on, has just gone into overbought territory. So they decide, right, I've got to short it. And we see it. We see this information all of the time. Um, if anyone wants that information, um, I can show you at the end of the presentation whereby we can literally go and uh, see, get a visual um, of what retail traders are doing. So I can show you at the end of that. And this is a typical sort of thing you might see on, um, um, on one of these sites here where you know, a market's actually going higher, but it's showing that 73% of retail are actually short as the market's actually going higher against them. And all that happens is because so many of them don't use stop losses, they go underwater and they go underwater some more, and then they start adding to the losses. You know, it just gets worse. And no wonder we have to have these risk disclaimers these days because um, to try to ensure that um, more retail traders um, take trading more seriously and, and do it in the right way. Okay, so the desire to be right as well. So all the traits so far um, are embedded in that desire to be right. Uh, we go through life, as I've already said, being educated that we need to be right as much as possible, but this doesn't work well with trading and co actually causes stress. And a lot of people who strive to be right as much as possible are more likely to be stressed because they don't use stop losses. So if they go underwater, then it gets very stressful for them. And um, that desire to be right raises those cortisol levels within their, um, within their bodies, which is not healthy over the long term. So um, we don't want that. Realistically, as a trader, you don't really want to have much emotional response at all. Now, we are human beings, so we are emotional things. But we want to try to uh, tame the emotional responses that we have to our trading as much as possible. We don't want to allow ourselves to get down on a losing trade. But likewise, we don't want to be euphoric on a winning trade either. Because if we, get, if we allow ourselves to get excited or euphoric on winning trades, how are we going to feel when we next have the, 
the, the next losing trade comes along. Well, it's like we're going to be a bit depressed and frustrated and all of that. So we don't want to have that range of emotions. So we you're going to feel it a little bit on uh, in response to trades, but we want to try to limit that as much as possible. And there's all sorts of things we can do to do that. I said earlier on, we need to run towards um, some of these things and we do need to embrace uncertainty. The fact is that on any trade that we go into and any individual trade that we get into, it's a 50-50 call. Let's, and so it's uncertainty. doesn't matter what the work, the effort is that we've put into our trading. It, the outcome, the answer is, you know, we don't know. We do not know at outset. So what we can focus on is the things that are in our control. So work on what we can control, worry less about what the market does once we've executed a trade, because it is outside of our control. And the better we get at that, the better we get at following our plan and just focusing on all of those ingredients, the things that we can control, the better we are off um, not worrying so much about the, the outcome, because over 100 trades, um, the outcome um, should sort itself out. Okay, let's go into a typical trading approach I use. So the main point I've made so far is that retail traders, what they do, they want to bank their profits early and they want to have a high win rate as much as possible. So I'm going to try and do the opposite of that. <laughs> okay, so that's what this path less traveled or road less traveled in trading is um, that I'm doing here tonight is all about. So the way I approach the markets is a top-down multiple time frame analysis. So I'm using multiple time frames um, uh, to analyze the market. I'm using intermarket analysis. So if I'm trading something like euro dollar, I'm not just going to look at a chart of euro dollar. I'm also going to look at other currencies against the US dollar as well. I want to see that, okay, if the euro dollar is going up, is the pound dollar going up? Is the Aussie dollar going up? Is the Kiwi dollar going up? You get my gifs. So a bit of intermarket analysis. And it's not just that. You know, I want to also see, are we in a, generally speaking, a risk on environment? So a risk on environment would tend to see uh, currencies going up against the dollar, um, uh, the US stock markets rising generally as well. And so that intermarket analysis, bond yields probably falling, US bond yields falling. So that that typical um, intermark analysis is quite important as well. So I want to identify an overall trend. And then I'm going to use a pullback combined with divergences uh, to trade in the direction of that trend. Simple stuff, really. It's highly, uh, it's, it's a simple, a very simple approach, but trading is simple. You're either buying breakouts or you're buying pullbacks within um, certain moves. And that's all this is. But it's then about how I go about applying it and looking for targets and all that sort of stuff. So let's have a look at a an example here. So this is a an example. In fact, I gave this, pre this very presentation at the end of March to two Tick Mills clients um, in London, at, yeah, at the end of March, so just a few months ago. And I've just updated the some of the, the, the screenshots here, but I've left these ones here because it's really ideal. Because if anyone here tonight was at that presentation, uh, we were, we, it was done in the Shard at the Shangri-La Hotel, then um, you, you might may remember some of these screenshots. So first things first, the, this is a daily chart of the euro dollar. And at the, at the time that the screenshot was taken, I had first entered my, my positions here. So I'll go through all that in a moment. But for starters, this is the daily chart. Now, on the uh, a quarterly chart, I said I use multiple time frame analysis. So on a quarterly chart, I um, I'd identified this long term support, which was what the euro dollar had hit back in down here back in September the 28th uh, of last year. 
So this was a key, key level because it was the high of the year 2001 um, of the, I think it was the high of the quarter that the euro actually launched. So it was the highest in that first quarter when the euro actually launched. And then, of course, this is a composite chart because it's going all the way back into the 80s here. Um, it links back to the composite uh, low back here as well. So we'd had this, this low that had been made back here. So at this point, we're coming now. That was low made in 28th of September, as I said, last year. Uh, the daily chart that I just showed um, is at this point where this screenshot was taken. So coming back to the, um, the previous chart, we can see that low there of, um, I don't think you can see my cursor. I'm not sure if you can or not. But anyway, so that's the low there of 28th of September. So we've started trending up. I've got a 50 day moving average here. So it's just an, um, a very commonly used moving average there and price. So overall, we've been trending up off of that key low that was there. So I wanted to be a buyer using my top down analysis. There was a few other things. If I go back to the other chart, we'd come down to this low here. Um, we'd come back up to this long term trend line, this declining trend line. I was looking for a break. We'd already breached that trend line back here. Um, but ultimately rolled back over. And then coming into the early parts of this year, we've come back up to that trend line. So I'm looking at that point for, you know, for it to break what it was breaking at that point. So I'm looking for another a secondary attempt to break out there. You can see that I've got on my chart here a long-term channel. So yeah, we've got a long-term overall channel break that's actually taken place to take us down to here. I would actually quite like, uh, that would be quite cool if the euro at some point in the future comes back to retest that channel line, but that's probably way out into the future. Okay, so coming back to the chart now. So what I'm looking at, as I've said, is I'm looking for pullbacks and then divergences in order to get myself long. So on the daily chart there, I'm using an MACD, MACD indicator down the bottom, just standard settings, 12, 26, and 9, just your standard um, settings. And we've got a divergence down here. So we're making these progressive uh, lows down here. And the MACD indicator is making the blue line is making higher lows at each point here. So price is making slightly new lows. But, pro but the indicator is making um, higher lows. Very simple stuff, but just look at the, uh, the MACD line itself and you can see it making higher lows every time price makes a lower low. I'll go into a little bit more on this in just a moment. So essentially, I was looking and I was buying through here. In fact, I'd already bought, for the purposes of the exercise, I'd already bought here because it was already diverging at this point. Price started going up, and then um, Credit Suisse CS took place on this big down day here. So that was when Credit Suisse blew up, and price came all the way down. I had a stop right at the lows. I know some of you will say, oh, Charlie, you shouldn't have had your stop at the lows. Anyway, that's what I do a lot of the time. So I got nicked out there and then just had to go in the day later um, once I could see that the divergence was continuing. So again, just showing you, I'm not here to show you, oh, here's one I made earlier and, and this is how much it went up and all of that. I'm giving you the realities of what actually happened. So I had to get in again, um, having already got stopped out. Okay. So just zoomed in here, you can now see that MACD indicator making those higher lows. Um, from the first one there at the same time that price um, was making lower lows. So during this, I'm looking to be a buyer. I'm seeing at this point, uh, the euro potentially working its way up towards 112. So 112 area was my target. Okay, keep that in mind. In fact, 
there were divergences on more than one time frame. This is now the 12 hour time frame here. It's just using an FXEM feed. It's just on trading view. It doesn't matter which feed you use. So um, again, we can see those lower lows here on a 12 hour time frame. It's probably a bit clearer here, this distinct uh, divergence that's taking place on the MACD indicator there. So I had enough to get myself in uh, into the trade um, on the back of all the other analysis that I do as well. So this is where we are. At this point, um, at this point, yeah, okay, we've got to 107.95. And I think I even took a screenshot, there it is, of my PL at that point on one of one of my accounts. It was at 16,930 pounds at that point. Okay. And uh oh that was that was a it was a I can see the screenshot was taken at 108.30. Okay, 108.30. So yeah, just a little bit 30 pips above where this screenshot's taken. Okay. What happened next? Let's go and have a look. Right. Well, it carried on trending. So that's where it was at that point when I delivered that presentation and it carried on moving up, but did it get to my target? Ah, didn't quite do it. It got to just under 111. My target was 111.85, 111 I'm just being honest with you here because I, that's just the way that I trade. You have to be honest with yourself and your trading. I'll always be honest when it comes to delivering presentations as well. So it was a good run. The profits were built because I add to positions as well as I um, as they run in my favor. I was told many, many years ago, probably about probably about 17 years ago, um, I was having a conversation with a little boutique brokerage who dealt with hedge funds at the time. And I will never forget the CEO said to me, he said, the best traders I've ever seen, he said, are those traders who get into a trade and they wring it out for everything they can get out of it. And they'll hold it, they'll add to it, and they'll hold it <laughs> until it until it rolls over. And that, I always remember that conversation, but I didn't actually do anything with that information. I think that information, that conversation was... Um, around maybe 2006 or something like that. And I didn't do anything with that information for years. It took years before I started getting into trades and adding to them as well. So I didn't go off straight away and start doing that. But anyway, that's what I'll do. If I see an opportunity, I think is a, a larger opportunity, I will be looking to add to my trades. Now, as we can see, the euro didn't quite get up to 111.85. It rolled all the way over here into what? The, the end of May down here. So I got stopped out. So it rolled all the way over and I didn't make anything out of that money, that 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 trade at all. That account had actually got to 42,000 or so. That was this screenshot was taken when it was at 110.64. If we go back, yeah, it got to what one a high of one just below 111. So up there in the mid 110s or so, this account was up 42,000. So um, and that pretty much all got given back. So um, going back to what I was saying at the beginning of the presentation, a lot of traders would want to try and fix that. Yeah. So, oh, well, we can't let this happen again. I must fix this. I trust in my processes. I trust in my analysis. I know that there's absolutely no way out of 100 trades that start going into a nice amount of profit that 100 of them are all going to end up getting to my targets. I have to accept that some are not going to quite get to my target and they will just roll over. Trust in your process. And on this occasion, it didn't happen. But the entry was good. And that's what I'm talking about here tonight, that using the divergences there, once you've got a, uh, a piece of analysis, divergences are great for getting you in um, on a pullback within, within a general trend. And I'm just showing you there that, in fact, this one didn't quite work out. In fact, now if I go on... Um, Oh, this is where we were just as of, um, when did I take this screenshot? Just a couple of days or so ago. So 
the euro as we know and i think i i'm as i'm presenting here tonight i haven't looked at it but the euro was up in the 10970 or something like that um not long before i started presenting here tonight so um it's it has actually come up and um so it's working its way back up again um now funnily enough what happened down here in this zone not on this time frame not on the daily chart but on the lower time frames of the i think it was on the eight hour charts and the six hour time frames as well and the four hour time frames it was diverging again down in this zone here so the trend is still very much in place price has done another pullback and it's diverging there in that in that uh, place it's not diverging on the daily but we have to look i have to look at other um, slightly lower time frames as well anyway the euros up again as we speak um ah and that's why it's called the road less travel because most people don't want to get into trades and then see them roll back against them they want to trail their stops up now there's nothing wrong with trailing your stop up but the problem with trailing a stop is that in the main it's going to do its job of trailing stopping you out now for some people and with certain systems of trading that's the right way however in a lot of the testing that i've done um trailing a stop actually limits the total profitability of my approach so there's no point in me doing it i have to put up with these trades that do roll back over against me if i just keep trailing my stops then yes that's all very well on this instance with the benefit of hindsight if i had trailed my stop up to this latest low here then we could say oh yeah well you know it rolled all the way over so you could have come out up here for example but that's fine with the benefit of hindsight what if it had just pulled back a little bit and then took off again and i've just allowed myself to get trailing stopped out so i can't do that so i have to put up with that and that's why i say this is the road less traveled um, it's allowing your trades to breathe not choking the trade and if you've got bigger targets the bigger the targets you have the more room you need to give the trade otherwise that trade that was up what was it show forty two thousand at one point okay it never got there but if it you know, out of 100 trades plenty of them will and then it would have been a whatever the profit would have ended up being at so i have to put up with those that that roll over anyway let's move on so here's another example now this is going actually going back just a couple of years to 2021 and same sort of scenario this is but this is now using combined time frames again so this is on the weekly time frame and it's at this point here when the euro again pulled back to the 50 period moving average a key moving average so it's been in a nice trend all the way through this then it's pulling back pulling back to its average price and it's lovely that the average the moving average itself is sloping up so coming into that zone i'm on the lookout for buying opportunities so what am i going to be looking for i'm looking for a divergence going down to my through my time frames and at that point we've got a divergence from this low then down to this low and we can now look at the macd indicator it's now higher at this point than it was down here diverging against price then i just need to wait for a price signal to get me in to a trade so i need a price signal i.e i need price to start coming up to confirm that that that, that uh, divergence may well now be in place so that was a trade this was like i said just over over a year ago nearly two or uh, two years ago going back there using a combination of a weekly time frame right the way down actually to a four hour chart that ended up giving me the divergence to take a trade on that so you say okay well that had a great run didn't it because we go back out we go back out um, we can see that for weeks afterwards it looks like a couple of months it had two months worth of upside so i'll come back to that in a minute now i do have something else on my chart here you see these two wiggly lines those two wiggly lines are two five period exponential moving averages they're exponential ma's moving averages one is set to the high when you put it on your chart and one the other one is set to the low price 
So most moving averages, when you put them on a chart, they will default to the closing price. But most charting packages, you can actually choose whether you want a moving average based on the average high prices or on the average low prices. And that's what I'm doing there. And that creates these little bands, if you will. So what I'm looking for when we've got the divergence building here, I'm looking for price to close back up inside or above uh, in this instance, but inside those those two five EMAs. And once I've got that, that's my signal with a stop below the low um, to take along. Now, there's various different ways that you can trade this. And we have various different ways in my community to, of trading this. But I'm just giving you some overall um, heads up um, information here. OK, so you'd say, well, that's great. That was an excellent trade there, Charlie. You know, it went up for eight weeks. Well, it did. And it was a great trade. And I added to the position along the way. Guess what? It got to within 50 pips of my target and then rolled over. I didn't actually make any money on that trade either. I've purposely showing you trades that don't work out because the trade setups are great here and on the other example. But I just want to purposely show you ones that actually didn't work out because it just it's too easy for me to just say, oh, yes, I got in here and I got out there. So I'm deliberately picking out a couple of um, trades to say, yeah, that one didn't work out. It was a great run, didn't quite re reach my target and rolled over. But that's OK. It's the road less traveled. I'm not going to try and fix anything at that point in uh, in May or June of 2021. Just carry on when I follow my processes. Some of them will work out. Some of them won't. And um, and overall, it's a very profitable way of trading, trying to run your trades, running them for targets, doing your analysis. Sometimes they won't quite get up to those targets, but it's OK. It's OK. Don't try and fix it, <laughs> because if you start trying fixing it, fixing it, then you're tinkering with it and then tinkering it um, then messes up your entire results. So. OK, so in summary here, uh, sorry, I've, OK, I've, uh, there might be some comments I've not seen yet. Um, analysis for me always comes first. Top down analysis, intermarket analysis, even sentiment analysis. If you, analysis. If you want to see um, some sentiment, then I'll show you in a moment um, what those retail traders are up to right now. Um, so the analysis dictates my targets. Entries come from those lower time frames using divergences. Um, and this gives me a trend based trade. So all I'm doing is buying a pullback. So I'm fading the short term pullback. So I'm buying into that, that short term pullback. Using the, the two five EMAs gives me a helps me define the stop, waiting for price to close back inside those. And then I know, right, if I can now get in and I can now put a stop below the low. I can also add in as the trade moves in my favor. So if I've got a nice big target, then I will look to add into a trade. And that is the secret source. I don't do it on every trade, but the trades that I've got big targets on, I will look to add into. And those are the ones that I often say over the years that nowadays, you know, these sorts of trades, they're not the trades that make your week. They're not the trades that make your month. They're quite often the trades that make your year. Uh, this type of trade. And I love to embrace this. It's not easy holding on to trades for multiple weeks or sometimes longer. It's not easy. But, um, and that's the challenge of it all. But I know that that's not what the masses want to do. The masses want to get in and get out. I want to do what they're not prepared to do. Okay, by all means, check me out at charlieburtontrading.com um, or go to my YouTube channel, Charlie Burton Trading. And so by all means, check out. I've got plenty of uh, free content on all on mindset and the likes on YouTube as well. Um, and the final piece of advice before I actually come back and look at questions here is a nice little line here. I Just to use this as an arresting mechanism sometimes, if you have that propensity to want to bank profits early, just remind yourself, I can't afford to bank that profit early. 
just to act as an arresting mechanism sometimes, just to use that self-language to say, can I actually afford to bank this profit right now? Because if you do bank it, it might make you feel good in that moment, but is it going to pay for the losers? Because there's going to be losing trades that come along. So if you're banking it just to make yourself feel good in that moment, then that's a great line to use. Anyway, uh, that draws us quite neatly to the end of officially of the presentation. Let's have a look and see what questions we've got here. Okay, so Alex was saying, sorry, Alex, um, I'll read out your comment here. You've put it to hosts and panelists, that's fine. Um, you said, man, this is actually a problem for me. I'm glad I stayed home and came to see this webinar. That's very nice of you, uh, Alex. If you want to expand on that, by all means do. You did put that comment just to host some panelists, but I have read it out for you. You can just change it and, and put anything else there, Alex, to um, so that everyone can see your comments. Um, do you use MACD for confirmation? Uh, San, uh, Santanu, let's go back. So where we've got the MACD here, the MACD is to tell me that we've got a potential divergence. So at this point down here on this red candle here, I know that there's a potential divergence because the blue line here is higher than what it was over here. OK, so we can see it's diverging, but I need that big up candle or price buy. You don't have to use candles. I need that 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 price bar to go back up usually just inside the two five emas this was just a very large one and then it up closing above the upper upper one that doesn't often happen <clears throat> that then confirms that that divergence is there it's not a guarantee that of course there's no guarantees and this is still going to only have a given win rate so it's not a guarantee that it, it's always going to go up but that's the, the entry criteria, okay? So, and the nice thing is with this sort of stuff is you can go back and test it, of course, as you have, anyway. Uh, right, let's go back here. Um, and higher time frame, good for beginners. Our higher time, I think uh, Santanu uh, higher time frames are better for beginners. The problem that beginners have is they want to, they want to be active. They want to do a lot. <laughs> um, there's lots of questions coming through here. So I, I just realized how many people are here. Blimey. Um, so um, I will endeavor to answer all these questions as, as much as I can. So I will get to all of your questions here. I'm just working my way through. So, yeah, I mean, for beginners, beginners tend to want to be doing a lot. So like we do, we go to work and we want to feel like we're doing a day's work, so to speak. Um, we want to feel like we're we're doing something when we go to work. And it's no different if we're trading. But even a beginner who's not uh, full-time trading, because most traders just part-time trade, um, they're still better off trading off of the higher time frames. Because the higher time frames, there's less noise, less noise. And so for beginners, that's good. Beginners start going down to five minute charts. There's loads of noise. They get caught up in the noise and that's how they end up losing money and getting emotional. So yes, in answer to your question, um, higher time frames are better. Are the markets manipulated? Do they sweep for liquidity knowing where stops are laying, taking out stops and off they go in the direction uh, that you you had forecasted or they are they algorithmic <laughs> okay so there's a load of questions in one there um are the markets manipulated okay um one of my my uh members in my community is a 33 year veteran bond trader dave and um so he worked on the other side okay he worked for an institution managing oh I don't know, what, however much it was, they were, you know, billions they were processing, okay? Um, they are not bothered about what retail traders are doing. There's a lot of stuff out there on the internet about um, that sort of thing. Uh, that's good for people who are out there on the internet promoting all this sort of stuff because it creates fear in individuals and it makes you go and buy their courses, okay? So, the reality is the institutions are not interested in what um, 
Joe Bloggs um, is doing and where their stops are. What the market will do, um, it is in at certain times, it will gravitate to where orders are. So if there's a big collection of orders, then it's then a market may well go to where those orders are. Let me show you on the chart, though. And I think this is really important because people get really caught up in the whole liquidity zone stuff, which is liquidity zones. It's just where orders are. It's just a more common, more you know, uh, in trend <laughs> uh, expression of just where orders are. So, but markets still won't necessarily come down for it. Look at this chart here. Look, here's a here's a low here. Price could have very easily come back down and taken that low out because there will have been a build up of stops in in you know at that point but it didn't then it pulled back into this low went higher a little bit more higher a little bit more could have done a flush down into this low and then come back up now one of these people on the internet will go and find plenty of examples of charts where that type of thing has absolutely happened what i'm trying to say here is it doesn't happen all of the time um, so if you have your stop below a you know a typical low or above a high, there's still no guarantee that you're going to that price is going to come back down for your level. If the price wants to go up, it's going to want to go up. If there's more buying pressure, that's more important than market manipulation. So markets, I'm not saying there's not manipulation of sorts that you couldn't have some big players out there trying to move the markets around during less liquid times. But when you're trading something like Euro dollar, which is a highly liquid instrument, then manipulation per se isn't quite there. They're not interested in what you as an individual trader or, you know, uh, are doing. What they are interested in or what the market is trying to do is fulfill orders. That's the market's job is to fulfill orders so um, i'm not a massive conspiracy type i'm not saying that market manipulation is conspiracy i'm just using that word but i'm not really into that the markets just move and sometimes if they move against you and you get stopped out and then it starts going back in your direction again well we can get back in again rather than worrying about what these people out there on the internet are saying about things like you know, they're out to get you and all of that type of stuff. I don't buy into that. And, you know, and I've I've been doing this thing for 25 years now and I'm an authorized money manager. So you'd have thought that I might know. And like I've said, you know, I've got one of my members is an ex uh, institutional trader. And he said, yeah, why would we ever be interested in what retail are doing? We're just fulfilling orders of our clients, you know. So, yeah, don't worry about that. What have your returns been like over the years on average? Uh, well, Matthew, good question. Um, they vary. Um, I, I trade a, vary, a, a number of different accounts, you see, Matthew. I trade my pension money, which is very low risk. And actually, on my pension money, I only aim to make sort of between sort of 10 to 20 percent. If I have 10 to 20 percent in a year, I'm more than happy with that. So that it all comes down to how much risk I take per trade, of course. So on my pension uh, trading account, then I'm taking less risk per trade. So it's really a cruel measure to say how much do you make um, in returns, because really it depends. It's about relative returns, isn't it? Relative to how much you stake. Now, I do do uh, trading challenges as well. And the trading challenges, I do take more risk on. So I'll risk sort of one and sometimes up, you know, up to 2% on, a, on an individual trade. So on those trading challenges accounts, and if you go to my YouTube channel, you can find my live uh, broadcast of when I've done, I'm doing one at the moment. And the, the current, current challenge started at, I started with 20,000. And when I did uh, the last update, it was at 95,000. And that took about uh, two and a half years. So two and a half years. So 20,000 pounds into 95,000 in two and a half years. So it's about just under 400% um, as of the last update. So I do, I quite like doing these challenge ones because 
you know, they're more attractive. They, they're a bit more sexy and in that regard. But my my main pot of money, I don't trade like that because that's more that's a lot more speculative. And so I don't want to trade speculatively on my main um, accounts. So um, I have to make that clear. However, with this 20K challenge, I am over the next six years going to see if I can get it to the big seven figures. You never know. I, maybe I won't be able to get it there. Who knows what will happen? But that is the goal for that current challenge. And I'll keep doing periodic ab, uh, updates on my YouTube channel on that. Uh, what strategies do you use to add into positions? Uh, Jeff, I don't know if that's the Jeff Roberts. I'm not sure, but um, maybe not. Um, well, obviously you are the Jeff Roberts. Just I knew used to know a Jeff Roberts as well. Um, when it comes to adding into positions, Jeff, um, what I'm looking at is existing open um, open risk. So if I bring the pen up again here, so if my if I've got in here with an initial stop loss down here and price has been going higher, then it's not necessarily a strategy per se to add in. What it is is, well, okay, well, once my stop loss has been moved up a little bit, it might not be at break even, but it's been moved up a bit. Then I'm in a position and price has moved away far enough. Then I'm in a position to uh, add a new uh, a new entry up here because I've reduced my risk here, which means I can allocate new risk up here. So essentially, that's what I'm doing. It's a bit more complicated than that, but um, but that's the type of thing. It's not a strategy per se. I guess that is a strategy, but um, but that's what I'm looking at. Once price has moved far enough away that I can move, reduce my 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 existing risk, then it puts me in a position to add a new 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 put new risk on what are some of the things you can do to avoid being emotionally involved apart from walking away is there a way to train yourself to don't care uh, great question there andre thank you um uh one thing one way to help with not being so emotionally involved would be to um uh risk less per trade so downsize your position. Sometimes people will feel the emotions more. And so the more you feel the emotions, the more likely it is that you're basically position size too big. So one of the easiest things you can do is immediately go out there and half the size of whatever your existing positions are. So if you reduce your position size, your emotional attachment will come down as well. Don't worry. You know, you might say, well, I only risk 1% per trade, let's say right now. If I go down to a half, well, that's fine. Go down to a half or go down to a third or whatever the position size is where you're less sensitive towards the trade. Then over time, as your experience grows, then you can gradually move it up back up to know your original risk levels if that's what you wanted to do so that's a simple one is reduce the the risk that your the size of your positions because it could be that um that that's an issue but uh, like you said apart from walking away so that sounds to me like you're day trading there andre so what i would also suggest to you is to have a look at introducing some semi swing trading you don't need to be trading the way i do where i might be holding on to trades for multiple weeks but with the advent of these uh, time frames, like four, well, four hour charts have been around for a long time, but more people are starting to use six hour time frames, eight hour time frames, 12 hour time frames that you can actually trade off of four hour charts, eight hour charts, hold a trade for several days, and then you're still out if it gets your target based on those sort of time frames. So, you're less inclined to be sitting there screen watching if you're trading off those slightly more intermediate sort of time frames. So that may be something as well to help. But the other thing, and um, I would suggest um, getting Mark Douglas's book, Trading in the Zone, but one thing that he talked a lot about in his book was um, clustering, grouping your trades together. So one thing you can do is to say to yourself, this is just one trade in the next thousand trades I'm going to be taking. That helps desensitize the importance that you're placing on this trade right now. If you can start using that type of language to, 
it within your self-talk to say, look, what am I worried about the outcome of this trade for? This is just one trade in the next thousand trades I'm going to be taking. That All of that helps to desensitize. I do a lot of work on this with my community, but um, there's a couple of um, ideas there for you. Uh, many good trades, uh, many good trades argue you ruin your average entry price by adding to winners. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Um, hence, it's better to add all your size directly if you set up, if your setup is good. Any thoughts? Well, absolutely. So, I mean, um, um, I mean, I think one thing with trading is it's a very personal journey. Every, we all trade differently. Everybody here tonight, we all trade slightly differently. So, I'm not here to say, uh, oh, yeah, you, you have to trade this way. What I am doing, and I should have said this at the beginning of tonight's presentation, is I'm showing you a way, and it's a way that most traders don't want to trade. So I would rather do that. <laughs> but coming back to your point, yeah, so, and it's a valid point. So um, I'm, not, I'm not going, I'm actually in agreement with what you're saying. So if you, in this example here, if I've put my, my trade size on. So let's say I was risking 1% of my, of my account on that trade. Okay. Well, whether I add into this trade or not, I can still only put 1% if that's my maximum risk into the trade at this point. What I'm talking about, I mean, is you put your, you know, your maximum position size on here. And once it's got up to, let's say here, and your stop loss has been moved up a bit, well, why not add another one here? Yes, it brings your average price up. You're absolutely right. And that's why people don't like it. And that's why people don't like it, because they're too scared of what? It rolling back over and them getting trading stop and they get nothing out of the trade. And that's exactly why I presented what I presented earlier on. It's the road less traveled. I want to be where the masses don't feel comfortable because it's not comfortable but it's highly profitable. It's not comfortable. You have to take yourself outside your comfort zone and therefore work on your mindset, um, but it's highly profitable. So that's what I love about it. Okay, um, hopefully I've sort of answered that. Uh, and where's the pen gone? Um, do you change your targets after you're in a position, uh, meaning to say, is it a static or dynamic? Uh, Enzo, thank you. What kind of risk to reward ratios do you look for as an average? Okay, um, good questions here. Do you change your targets after you're in a position? Mostly no. Um, at the outset, I've already, I've already done the analysis at the, at, before I actually enter a trade. So I've already done all the analysis on targets before I get into the trade. So when I get into the trade, I know, right, I'm getting into a trade here. My stop loss is going to be here. Um, my take profit or my target price is, for argument's sake, up here. So I know all that in advance. So would I ever change my take profit or my target price up here once I've got into it? 98% um, of the time, no. I'll stay true to that. So what is the 2%? Um, I guess if there was something like a presidential election, <laughs> something really big, a major move. And I'm not talking about FOMC or anything like that. I'm talking about something major, major, major um, that... Uh, where I might say, actually, I'm going to adjust my take profit and I'm, you know, I've got close to my take profit. And actually, we've got this major event coming out, not just, you know, non farm payrolls or anything like that. So, but like I said, it's a very rare occasion that I would actually adjust it. Or it might just be that I've missed something in my initial analysis. You know, that would come in that 2% as well, where I've had to adjust it because I've missed something in the original analysis. But that that's quite rare that that would happen. And that's why I'm saying 98% of the time, because I can't think of an example at the moment. Um, what risk to reward ratios do you look for as an average? Um, my trades will vary, depends. Um, I do take bread and butter type trades, which will just be a one to two type risk to reward ratio. Uh, my biggest risk to reward ratio was one to 56, just to give you an idea, okay? 
Uh, are all, all inverted risk rewards a no-no for you under any circumstances? Uh, hi, Michael. Um, no. <laughs> no, I, I, you can make money with inverted risk reward ratios. You just need to have a high win rate. Um, like I said in the presentation, though, the, the, the only problem with high win rates that I, I've seen is that I tend to find people get more stressed with high win rate strategies because they're, they're so focused on trying, making sure that they are right eight times out of 10 or whatever, that if they're not, they get stressed by it. And traders with lower win, uh, win rates tend to not be so stressed because they have these bigger, slightly bigger risk rewards. So yes, you can, you can make money with intra uh, inverted risk rewards. Um, but it, there is a, a trade-off with that, that it, for a lot of people, they find it a lot more stressful. Um, Okay, right. So I've got another one here. Um, I've got so many questions here. There's there's probably too many of us here tonight because I am working my way through, but um, I've got so many questions. Edgar, I'm just getting onto your one, um, but I'm just going to switch over because there's some in the question and answer boxes as well. I'm going to quickly, there's about four in the Q&A boxes and there's loads in the main box. We will work our way through. Uh, Pan Dukana uh, says, do you ever take partial profits? Um, also, would you recommend moving stops to break even? Uh, yes and yes. Um, I do sometimes move. I do take partial profits along the way at t on certain trades. And yes, I will move stops to break even, but I, I don't, I'm not in a hurry to move the stops to break even. So I only move the stops to break even once um, price has moved comfortably away. So yeah. Uh, what have uh, Matthews asking, what have your trading returns been like? Oh, I've already answered that one. Um, thank you for the webinar. It was very useful. How do you manage risk while adding to a position? I think I've already answered that one, Vivian. Um, I've got one in French here. I'm sorry, I don't, un, I can't read French. Uh, will a recording be shared as I missed the beginning? Colan, I think that might be. Uh, yes, sir. You are, you've registered. So um, markets. Uh, sorry, God. <laughs> Tick Mill have said that yes, absolutely, um, it's being recorded here tonight. So you will be um, sent the recording, I'm sure. If you're not sent it, get in touch with Tick Mill. They're a great broker, by the way, and it's really it's uh, an honour for me to be uh, working with them like this and being able to do these presentations. So Edgar said, I think. Um, he did one or two great trades. Then he had 10 or 15 small losses, then one or two great trades again, and then many tiny losses again, all in a day. Uh, then I somehow managed to blow up my account. How can I stop this? Wow. Well, for one, you're over trading, Edgar. <laughs> if that's all happened in a day, um, you're trading too much. And so that's the first thing to sort out. You're way over trading. You at the moment are... A typical retail trader so you're taking loads and loads of trades um, of course within that you're going to have some that work out quite nicely but you're having too many uh, losses so it's likely um, and if you're blowing up just on having small losses then something isn't quite right so you need to look at your average risk and reward of your trading and because if you're blowing up then um, it sounds like I don't know what your it's, it's a risk management issue definitely um hi charlie how do i become a certified money manager how do you go about it thanks i'll come to that at the end lincoln um but essentially lincoln if you want to do that um you need to go to an umbrella organization and you need to go through some and um, some tests you can still get the equivalent of a cf30 so you can um take that exam um, and that would be a way of doing that. Um, and you also would need to uh, have a track record, of course. Um, so usually a three-year track record um, and all and all of the experience that comes along uh, as well. So that's, but there are companies out there in London that will regulate you if you do all that. Um, 
uh i mean when you add to winners how do you manage the risk uh do you move st- oh, i think i've already answered that i did that on a previous one so that's fine uh why don't you close partial profits or move your stops to break even after a reasonable move in price also do you plan for swap fees when planning your position size great question there uh panda Kana. um why don't you um close partial profits um or move your stops so if we go back to the uh, let's see if we can go back to uh, this trade back here. Um, I did say in the presentation why I don't move my uh, why I don't um, uh, move my stops up. I would bank partial profits. Panda Canner, in fact, that one eleven eighty five was a level. It was a take profit, but it was also it was a partial take profit. I was going. I was still going to hold on to some of my position. In fact, so that was where I was going to take a partial profit. So it still hadn't even got to that. It was a great run. With the benefit of hindsight, <laughs> you know, of course I could have come out earlier, but um, but we don't have that benefit. So, um, and like I said in the presentation, I could have just carried on, you know, trailing a stop up here and here and here. Um, but, and yes, with the benefit of hindsight, I would have made more money um, that way on this individual trade. But like I said in the presentation, I'm not interested in the outcome of this trade. I'm interested in the outcome of the next 100 trades or 1,000 trades. And so I have to put up with the fact that um, there's going to be trades like this, which will roll all the way over and I end up getting stopped, stopped out down here. Um, and so why not bring my stop up further? Why not? Because there will be plenty of trades like this where – I bring my stop up further, it comes down, stops me out, and then goes all the way back up. I'm now out of the trade, and um, and I've now missed out on um, having built up a position as well. Um, all right, I bank to profit, but I'm not interested in, oh, this trade had the potential to be, I guess, uh, on that account that I showed earlier on, I don't know, maybe a, a 60 or 70,000 pound trade. It was only at 40,000. So I'm never going to make 60 or 70 on that account if I'm always coming out at, well, at this point, it would have been at around about 30,000 profit. So I can choke my trade and guarantee a profit, or I can hold on and make a sacrifice of seeing some of those trades roll over and amount to nothing. But it doesn't matter because there will always be those trades that do carry on and make those larger profits. Like I said, we want to fix things. We're like, oh no, we can't let that happen. The reality is I'm looking at the overall profitability, not the outcome of this trade. I would have loved this trade to have carried on, of course. But I have to look at it as an entirety. And over the years of trading that I do, that I've done, I have to look at it that way rather than trying to fix it and think, well, I'll, I'll trail the stop up next time. And and then I'll because all that'll happen is there'll be plenty that that happen like this. I get trailing stopped out only for it to go higher, and then and then you end up kicking yourself, saying, "Oh, I shouldn't have done that, and uh, I could have, you know, should have held on for the main target." So there's your up. As far as swap fees are concerned, of course I plan for swap fees. Um, swap fees, I always see it as just the cost of doing business. So um, they can, you know, swaps are gonna build but they're not that big you know i'm trading the majors here and um all right if you're trading dollar yen for example and you're trading on the the wrong side of the swap fee then that's going to accumulate probably a bit quicker but so there might be slight decisions to make um in that regard but in the main um i see it as just the cost of doing business and it's just a small part of the profit uh, what if I choose intraday trading tamer um, as my trading style? I'm um, am I going to be a good trader? I don't know, tamer. You might be. Um, so, in answer to your question, yeah, I'm not saying that you have to swing trade, but the statistics, the statistics are that swing traders um, fare better than intraday traders, not intraday traders who have got loads of experience. What I'm talking about here is people who get into trading. A lot of people who get into trading think that day trading is the holy grail because they're going to be sitting there and doing lots of stuff. Um, well, 
one, you can make just as much money from swing trading as you can from day trading because I used to be a day trader. Like I said, I've won day trading competitions five years in a row at the London Forex show. Um, so I've done a lot of you know, day trading over the years, but you get to a point for me where I wanted to have a bit more time on my hands. And so swing trading is a natural um, move um, to enable that. Um, so I don't know whether you're going to be a good day trader or not, but the statistics say that people who get into trading, the people who go to day trading, there's a bigger fallout rate of people that get into day trading than those who get into swing. And it's all because of emotions. It's because of that emotionals, the emotional discipline that you need in order to day trade. And a lot of people find that very difficult and then they'll they'll make mistakes. So, you know, it's up to you. I'm not trying to say don't do it, but the odds are slightly more or are more against you in that. Don't get me wrong, there are plenty of profitable day traders, but they are a smaller in number. Uh, do you scale out of trades and take partial profits? Already answered that. Uh, what is your YouTube channel name? Charlie Burton Trading, uh, Santanu. Um, why price fall good uptrend, downtrend without any key levels? Um, I don't understand that question. Uh, will we be able to see a replay? Yes, um, it is being recorded, Stevan. Um, uh, thanks, Dave. Uh, no problem. Uh, Jeff. It is Jeff Roberts. Oh, nice to see you if you're still here. <laughs> uh, still remember that? Yes. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, well, you know, time has to move on, Jeff. So, and uh, uh, yeah. Uh, how do you avoid losses with your stops? Some traders don't use stops and wait for the market to move up, leaving them open to negative uh, open trades. Uh, Mark, um, how do you avoid losses with your stops? Um Right. Yeah. OK, so that's my point. If you don't use stop losses, then you're more likely to blow up an account, because if if you get into a trade here and you have no stop loss and the market just starts coming down and down and down and down and it doesn't come back up, and it just carries on coming down. Well, you're just going to sit in it and you get until you either blow up an account or you get to a point where you can't handle the pain anymore and you close out and you've destroyed 70% of your account. It's not a good thing. So you don't avoid losses. My point, <laughs> the whole point of using a stop loss, if I've got a stop loss here, is to guarantee that I'm going to get, I'm going to have a loss. I'm going to get stopped out. That's the whole point. There's a point at which on the chart, and using with a given with a, spe a specific strategy where I say, right, if I'm going to get in here like I did with a stop loss down here, if I'm wrong and it comes down to here, yes, I'm going to have a loss. But if I'm only risking 1% of my account on that trade, I can afford to have a lot of losses. So it's just back down to the basic just risk management. So only risk, use, use calculators, position size calculators, which will help you to um, get the right position size for the stop loss you want to use. So if that stop loss was, for argument's sake, 80 pips, you would put into your position size calculator, your account balance, your total account balance, how much you want to risk. So let's say I'm just making this up 1%, it might be half a percent, whatever it is. You put the, the uh, how far away the stop loss is going to be, and it'll give you tell you what the position size is going to be. So it might say, okay, you've got a 0 0.06 of a lot position size. So you put that position size on. If it doesn't work out, all you've lost is 1% of your account in this example here. So just normal, good risk management. Uh, uh, you enter, yeah, we'll leave that with uh, you asking for a PDF of the presentation, I think. Um, yeah, I'm sure if you ask uh, Tickmill, then um, I can sort that out for you. Andre, you've enjoyed the presentation. Thank you very much. You've got to run shortly. Yes, we are running, yeah, uh, an hour and 20 in now. So we're going to have to, I'm going to try and run through these questions. I'm catching up 
Um, but my word, there's still another 30 messages I've just seen. Um, so what we're probably going to do is I'm going to do 10 more minutes. We will finish at half past. I didn't realize there's so many questions here still coming through. So what are the top three philosophies you stick to that has been the most rewarding for you? Were you trading crypto for one to 56? <laughs> uh, no, I wasn't trading crypto for one to the 156. It was an FX trade. Um, the top three philosophies I stick to that have been the most rewarding. Um, <clears throat> well, certainly adding into trades. That was something that I only really started doing in about 2013. So adding into trades was something I started doing in 2013. So you've got to bear in mind, I'd been trading 16 years at that point before I started doing that. That's certainly, um, and that I've really enjoyed that process. So that's one philosophy, so to speak, of adding into the winning trades. It, I like it because I know that the masses don't like it. Um, another philosophy is mindset. So trading, doesn't matter how good your technical strategies are, trading is all about mindset. I've seen thousands of traders over the years, and I've seen traders with lots of experience and traders with not lots of experience. And um, all of them, if they don't work on their mindset, um, struggle. So one of my top tips is always work on your mindset. Um, I, like I said, I spend a lot of time with traders on mindset. So that would be, is key, key, key to my trading. Um, I'm trying to think of another philosophy for you, um, you say to stick to. Um, always using stop losses. So just a, a technical one, always having a protective stop. So I would never trade without a stop loss. That's what, again, the masses would do. Right. Um, if I was a day trader or if you were a day trader, would your trading philosophy be different regarding letting profits run and adding to winners? Yeah. Um, on day trading, I wouldn't necessarily add to winners on day trading because um, the the whole, you know, you, you're not running trades for as long so i probably in the main there might be the occasional one but i mean but in the main no i wouldn't be adding to intraday trades no um less likely and yes would my trade management be a bit different yes bearing in mind you know i did use the day trade quite a lot um then i think in day trading you need to be a little bit more um what's the word um uh, maybe a little bit more aggressive in, in some of the trade management. Um, thanks, Alexander. Uh, thanks, Tamar. Uh, okay, great. You've got a team viewer that's got a risk calculator. Oh, I've just realized I've got, I'm getting to the bottom. Do you believe in linear exponential bet sizing, i.e., for example, risking half percent on C set setups, one percent on B setups, and two or three on A setups, uh, and not just one percent on every setup? Great question there. Um, I do actually, I mean, um, I do like to vary position size on based on the quality of the setup. Yes. Um, uh, oh, it's nice to hear. Well, it's not nice to hear. Alu uh, Adamili, uh, Alu uh, Damil, sorry, um, says that trading without stop, list, stop losses have done more damage to his accounts. We all have to learn. You know, when I started trading 25 years ago, I blew up an account. I didn't use stop losses. So, you know, everyone learns and starts somewhere, but, you know, it's not nice that that's happened to you, but at least you've learned from it and you'll always use stop losses from now. Adding to trades, mindset and stop loss, your advice has been most helpful. Oh, thank you, Z. Uh, and another one from Crescent saying, thank you. Let's uh, make sure. Great, we've got to the end. Well, that was a lot longer than I thought. Uh, I think we're going to be doing another one next month. So I'll be doing another uh, webinar on a different topic next month. Hopefully some of you can make it there. And uh, thank you ever so much for attending tonight. Um, uh, we'll call that an end to tonight's webinar.